So hi and welcome to the Rags to Riches show with myself, Terry Blackburn. So today's guest is a guy called Daniel Moses. So he's from Nigeria originally and he moved to the UK, I think it was 2004, I've done my research Absolutely. correctly. I got it right, yeah, good. Um, he's been involved in property for a while now. He's used multiple different strategies to get to where he is today. He has a best-selling book. He has a property education company. Um, and he's been successful in pretty much every strategy that he's done my, is my understanding. So I want to dig a bit deeper about the strategies that he's done and then he currently does. And he can sort of tell you more about when, how he's got to where he is today and share his story and hopefully some lessons and learnings throughout the, the episode. So welcome to the episode, Daniel. Thank you so much, Terry, for having me on this show. I'm just really, really fired up and excited to be here. And thank you for that great introduction. Good. You're welcome. You're welcome, Dan. And, and, and nice to chat with you properly. Now we've only had a couple of brief chats, haven't we? Uh, one just before the show there. Um, seemed like a really, really nice guy. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to the episode. Absolutely. But what we like, what we like to do, Dan, is just sorry, do you prefer Dan or Daniel? Daniel. Daniel, Daniel. Okay, so so what we like to do, Daniel, is talk about your life so far and your journey. And we'll sort of partition it up into three parts. So the start would be the, you know, your upbringing and how you got into property. The middle part would be the exciting part, the growth part. And then the current would be just what your attention is on right now, what you're looking at, what you're looking at currently and what you're looking at going forward. So if you could give us a brief sort of overview of each of those parts, Dan, I think that would be great. And we'll try and extract some of the lessons from each part. So starting off with the start, your upbringing and how you got into property would be great. Yeah, I mean, um, first of all was uh, basically my journey, you know, my journey was growing up as a, a child, I wanted, I just wanted the best in life. Um, I was born and raised into a very large polygamous family way back in Africa. My dad married seven wives and had 30 children. And uh -huh. so, sorry, this, sorry, so it's just say that again. <laughs> I had seven wives and 30 children. Yeah, my dad married yeah, seven right. wives because he was a traditional ruler. Uh, wow. He married seven wives. I had 30 children and I'm the 26th born of my late wow. father. Um, have a lot of my family's massive, 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 massive. So while growing up, I didn't really grow with my dad. You know, I was raised by my mom. Uh, because of the usual dramas in the family, you know, my mom being the second wife and being one of the most favorite wife of the family and the favorite wife to my dad. So I was raised single-handedly because my mom at some point didn't, you know, couldn't, you know, uh, stay with my dad at the time where I was born. But my mom never remarried. She only moved out of the house. So I, um, I was raised by her. She raised me really well, disciplined me and... You know, in Africa, one of the biggest things is discipline. So she raised me and I uh, went through to second primary school, secondary school, university. But I went to university really just to be able to identify with my mom in terms of, you know, having a, a degree to my name. Mm. Because I, I, I didn't really study what I wanted to study. I wanted to study law. Originally, I wanted to be a lawyer. Uh, but uh, at that university I went into, for some reason, I wasn't given the course I wanted to read. Instead, I was given a course that was opposite of what I wanted to read, which was sociology and anthropology. So I started to understand it a little bit, but I never really did anything with it. But towards the, I think, two, three years into my university age, I just wanted to have a better life. I wanted to become an entrepreneur. I wanted to be a business person because while growing up my brothers my relatives they all lived in different parts of the world america japan everywhere they lived all around these places again their journey was in search of a greener pasture and a better life so they will always send things back to me while i was in uni and i would trade this materials for sale make profit so that would be from they shoot cars from, from, from wherever, I, you know, what part of the world it was to bring in anything, even, you know, um, handsets, the, the old style handsets to sell, use clothes, you name it, everything. Yeah. So I literally was the guy, 
while I was at university, they bring all these things for me. I would sell. I was really, really popular, you know, when I was in um, when I was in secondary and uh, when I was in university. So at some point, I decided to myself travel. I said I would when I graduate. I was going to travel to maybe America or maybe the United Kingdom. Though there was in vast majority of my family that was in the UK, but I did know one or two people that. The, the thing about Nigerians is that if you have a friend that you become very close to, you can always identify to them as your brother, your cousin, your auntie. It's very common in the African community. So some of the people that I knew in the UK, I would, you know, I'll classify them as oh, my auntie, my uncle. So when I first decided to travel, I came through to the UK as a visitor, you know, and you know, I loved the really, I really loved the culture. I loved the way of life. I loved, I just loved everything basically. I fell in love when I just came to the country, you know, for the fact that I can go to Peckham in London and I can walk the street of Peckham and I can see a lot of black people, a lot of African shops and I could walk up and buy plantain. So I'm like, wow, this is England, but it feels like home, you know, and very gradually I started to, you know, mix with the African community. And I think cut long story short, I decided to say, you know what, I am going to live in this country, but it wasn't all that easy. Um, I didn't have papers. I didn't have what it, you know what it takes to reside in the UK and work legitimately because I was on a visiting visa. You know, I was on a visiting visa, so I had to just do any little thing for people and get paid just to kind of survive while I was here. So I think I ended up spending a couple of months and I returned back to Africa. And at some point, when I returned back to Africa, I felt like, well, should I go back really? But I really love the country. But then settling in this country was something that was again another story in its own not very easy to become resident or even become a citizen so I had to compare all of this but anyway I took a leap of faith came back to the UK uh, a couple of I think there was the following year came back again and again did the same thing would help a friend of a friend aunties clean their kitchen I would help a friend of a friend clean their restaurant a friend of a friend help them sell stuff you know, and, you know, I was just surviving. But every time I went back and forth from Nigeria to the UK, from UK to Nigeria, I will myself buy like cars. I will buy clothes. I will ship it myself because this is what I was used to when I was way back as the university boy, the guy, the family members trusted and stuff like that. And that was just me. And, and how old were you at this point? Um, I was about probably just around about 22. Okay. Yeah, so just about around 22. So, and this was just the story. So, um, and I think I remembered in one of my other journeys back, you know, to do the same thing, take back stuff to Africa. Mm. I um, decided to, um, to go out on this day to a shopping center with some of my friends I've made here. Because all of a sudden, I was mixing with a lot of African communities. So I was on a bus, drive, you know, going from point A to point B, and I bumped into this amazing lady. And um, that gave me the more reason to say England was my home. It was like almost love at first sight. And I walked up to her. We had a conversation, you know, and we just started a relationship gradually and gradually and it kind of got really deeper within three months and i remembered you know a couple of months later i proposed to her got married 2006 at the age of 26 now i'm married and it was like everything happening very quick very fast you know and we got married went back to nigeria got married and everything and i remember a lot of people laughing at me saying, what are you doing at the age of 26, getting married, you must be really desperate, you must be this, you haven't had enough time, you don't have enough experience. And I gave, you know, I literally said, you know what, I don't care what anyone thinks, I love this woman, she's been kind to me, you know, in a city or in a country where I had no relatives, she's become my sister, my mother, my auntie, my girlfriend, and now my wife. So we really kind of clinged into each other. You know, we went through a lot of challenges anyways, but Mm. That was how I eventually settled in this country. And again, I continued doing what I needed to do. That would be buying things, shipping to Africa. So I continued to do what I was doing. I, you know, I really never had to go and work that 
you know, for someone. Or those once in a while, could dip in doing, you know, cleaning for people, doing the, there was a, something that, there was a job I, I remember I used to do for one of my uncles and his nightclubs, you know, where I would basically spray perfumes. I don't know if you've been to nightclub and see the boys in the toilets, they spray you perfumes, give you lollipops, chewing gums just to freshen up, you know, and you, you hear them shouting in the nightclub, freshen up for the ladies, you, you know, they just kind of, so I was one of those guys. I did, oh, wow. you know, I did anything, just anything to get by. And um, at some point I thought the greener pasture that I was looking for was here. So before I knew what was happening, I got, had my first child in 2008 and the fatherhood responsibility kicked in at the age of 28. And, you know, I, life was good. But again, I wasn't really enjoying the life that I thought I was really loving. But cut long story short, came down to 2012. Um, I was just not feeling England anymore. So I woke up one morning, I told my wife, I said, listen, I think I need to relocate back to Africa. You know, I, I think I need to go and do better for myself. And the greener pasture, the better life I'm looking for is not happening. And she said, well, I'm not relocating. This is my country. This is where I know all my life. It was tough. But anyway, cut long story short, she said, you have to go and do what you need to do to look after me and look after our kids, right? So I give you my permission. So I relocated everything I had gathered here in the UK, took it back, you know, started up um, um, with some inheritance that my father, my late father left for me. I, um, I started my oil and gas business in Nigeria where I was, you know, transporting refined products from the depots to like share petrol stations, BP petrol stations, where the end user will fuel their car with petrol or diesel or kerosene. I started doing that business and it really was a game changer for me. While I thought, oh my God, you know, life is good now, I'm making it all again. Three years later, I had a massive loss in my business. Two of my trailers that was in transit, taking product from point A to point B. Had an accident, ran into each other on convoy, bumped into a ditch, crashed, and lost over 150,000 pounds in a single month and a day. Wow. So I went into depression. I went into anxiety. I was confused. I was, I thought I was just like, they this whatever i'm looking for it's never going to happen because it seems to be like challenge after challenge failure after failure what is it that i'm good at you know i started to ask myself all these questions you know then i went through the most difficult time in my marriage went through the most difficult time you know and it was really really hard for me just like every other person has a story you know of what they've been through so I just decided and said, you know what? I'm just going to go back to the UK now. 2015, I'm just going to forget about what I was doing in Africa. I've gone through this situation. I'm relocating back again uh, to the UK. Got back here, was, you know, feeling tired, feeling it, was having anxiety, mm -hmm. going through panic attacks. Um, and I said to my wife, I remember my wife asked me, what is it that you're going to do now? You've done so many things. What is it that you're going to do now, Daniel? I said, I don't know. And... I remember saying to her, you know what, I'm just going to get a delivery job and just kind of, as long, as long as we can eat, drink, we're happy. Let's just focus on the love. Yeah, and I hope the love will get us by. Yeah. And this is me now just saying, you know what, entrepreneurship was not for me. I was saying to myself, success wasn't for me. I have failed so many times, nothing worked. You know, uh, the clothes I was selling wasn't scalable. The cars, parts, you name it. Everything I'd done wasn't scalable. So success, I accepted failure. Mm. And after accepting failure, I uh, just said, I'm good for delivery driving job. And I was, just, I was just doing it. I remember doing it for a couple of months. Then I, someone said to me, well, if you're doing delivery, why don't you try being an Uber driver? You know, because you can make maybe twice more than you're currently making and as an Uber driver. You know, and you can get to really meet people as well, talk to people instead of doing delivery where people don't really talk to you. So I said, all right, I pick up a leap of faith and I um, started being an Uber driver. And I would, once I got my Uber driver's license, I would, I think I remember driving minimum 120 hours to about 100 hours a week <laughs> to make a decent amount of money, you know, month in, month out. 
did it for the first couple of months, enjoyed it, first 12 months, enjoyed it. But then again, I'm like, oh, my days. Every single time I started asking myself, is this the future? Is this me now? You know, what happened to the young Daniel Moses who wanted to be great, who wanted to, you know, to impact life, who wanted success? What happened to that guy? I started asking myself all these questions. And especially in the foreign country where I had no siblings in this country, no mother, no father, no aunties, no uncles. The people I actually ended up calling family are people that I met in this country who were Blacks, Nigerians, and who was also maybe trying to survive themselves. These are people who became my family. These are, these are people I call cousins now. So, um, part long story short, um, I remember becoming very close to God, started going to church really well. I started, you know, reading the Bible. I started praying more. And I remember one of these days I was bringing someone, I, I dropped someone in the airport, one of the airports in the UK. Uh, in London, so I think it was either Stansted or um, it was either Stansted Airport or it was Heathrow, no, it's not Heathrow, Gatwick. I remember I was a bit tired, just driving back, and I fell asleep. Uh, I was feeling asleep, sorry, I was feeling asleep. So I pulled up into a petrol station to park, and I fell asleep once I parked in the petrol station, and I had a quick, very short nap. And I remember waking up from that short nap. And I had a kind of, it was like a dream of me seeing different properties. It's like, you know, just something telling me it was a time for change, which I believe was God, you know. And I remember waking up from that sleep and looking through my phone and saw an advertisement, you know, inviting me to a free property training program, or rather a networking, actually it was a networking event. And it was it wasn't free. This was way back in 2017. It wasn't free. Okay, I had to pay 70 pounds for that networking event. It was two hours somewhere in London. I attended that, and I was just there. And I'm like, so if people can get into property using every single strategies these guys are talking about, why is why I've never why have I never heard about this? And that was how my journey in property that was the moment started it was just like that one moment and one thing i learned from this is that sometimes we all have something that you are called to do in life we all have a career whether you discover it through education whether you discover it through the self and personal development whatever it is that you discover through but there's that one moment that will always come back to you regardless of how many times you fail that you will connect with it and it would, whether, wherever you believe in, whether it's universe, the, whatever your religion is, it just comes to you and you realize this was the one for you. And that moment, I said, I'm going to go all in. This will be what will change my life. And I, that was why I said, I remember before the speaker finished, I already raised my hand. I'm in, sign me up now. Sign me up now, please. Even though I did not have the money to pay for the three days course. But I was like, sign me up now. Whatever it's going to take, I'm going to that training. And that is how I got into property. I was thought. Can I, I'll just jump in if, on a couple of things that I picked up. Um, so you had multiple setbacks, right? Before you found your call and before you found your thing, there was the business that went wrong. There was obviously moving the countries. There was personal things going on as well. I think some people listening might be able to relate to that. Because, you know, it's quite common for people to have adversity and setbacks throughout their life. Yes. But it seems like you kept going and you kept going and you were, you know, you, you dealt with all this rejection and the things that happened. Why do you think that is? Why, why do you think you kept going and looking for your thing? Is it, is it a mindset thing? Was it in you from an early age? Is it, have you just been determined? What, what is it do you feel that, you, that kept you going throughout that adversity? I mean, throughout everything I went through in my life, one of the things that kept going was I just had that thing inside of me telling me I will be great. I, you know, no matter what, you, you, you're better than anything that you are now. You mm -hmm. would be great. Just keep going, keep going. Mm -hmm. You know, and I believed in the voice that told me that, you know, Daniel go and read all the religious book that has ever been read about Daniel. You know, he was thrown into the lion's den. He never get fed in the Christian book of the Bible, all right? 
and even people interpret my name. So I had identified that for me to be called Daniel, for my name to be called Daniel, there is definitely greatness in me. For me to be successful, there is something massive inside of me. And I said, I would not give up regardless of the roller coasters of life that, mm. you know, presented to me. And also, as I went through the challenge after challenges after challenges, I wanted I see people living a good life. I see people living in the good houses. I see people driving a nice car. I see people going on holidays. And when I see these things, I'm like, I deserve that. Mm. I deserve to wear a good clothes. I deserve, I deserve to drive a good car. I deserve to, you know, to impact life. You know, when I saw people who were drowning, when I saw a beggar on the street, someone who is begging money on the street, I felt like I have something to to give to that person but I cannot give to that person or change that person's life if I don't fix myself if I don't become great how can I help people how can I be a good person if my wife depends on me my kids depends on me if I don't fix me how am I going to be a role model to my son how am I going to be a role model to my daughter my wife my community so I just felt like there was something in me that I would one day impact life, but I just didn't know what I was doing. But yeah, you were something in the, just you were in the right vehicle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that, and I think the, there'll definitely be, be people listening or watching that can relate to that because some, well, some people don't actually believe in themselves. And like you just rightly said there, if you don't believe in yourself, no one else is going to believe in you. You're not going to attract investors. You're not going to be able to close deals. So the starting point is getting you right. It's fixing you. If you don't believe in yourself, you need to start. And if you already believe in yourself, you just need to be persistent. Yes. And I think one, one other thing that you said, which I liked there was you felt that you deserved what other people had, you know, as in the nice houses, nice cars, nice holidays, nice clothes. But some people don't actually deserve believe that they deserve these things either did so i think that's a almost like a self-limiting belief that people may need to change in themselves because if you don't if you believe that you don't deserve that there's a yes. strong chance you're never going to get that absolutely absolutely you know and one thing that one thing i realized was was that you know all the good cars the watches every of this good thing man created them right for man to consume them you know, when people fly business classes, first classes, man created this luxury for man to enjoy them. These are the, for the enjoyment of life. To a, a clear mind, a clear, a clear mind is what creates wealth. A mind that is crowded, a mind that is not expanding. You can't, you can't create. So, and I needed to get to a place where I can create. I wanted to become a creator, but I needed to fix me but I did not know what was driving it. But I just knew that one day I'm going to create something. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and, and that is it. Because we all have, this is the thing, right? We all have that sort of voice. You have two voices talking to you every day. You have the voice of a monkey. You have the voice of a lion. The truth is the lion is, is a bigger animal. You know, the king of the jungle. You know, every other animal is scared of him, Right? because of his ability. But when these two voices of a monkey and a lion speaks to you, do you know the voice that you listen to the most? You listen to the monkey, the naysayers, the one who tells you, why do you want all these things? And I was born and raised in a community where, you know, yes, success is great, but people tell you, why do you need all these things? Money is the root to all evil, you know? And, you know, why do you need that? You don't need all of that. You just calm down, you know, be you, you're good the way you are. I remember when I started sharing with people that I wanted to become a property investor. Now, when I started educating myself and everybody that I spoke to told, told me, you'd have a business that's, that, that got, you know, that, that basically crumbled in Africa. You lost a lot of money. Why do you want to get back into business? You know, you have all these naysayers and these naysayers can be even your closest auntie, your closest uncle, even your wife, yeah, even your also. husband. Yeah, you know, it's insane. But the reason why people stay where they are is because they start to bow to the voice of the monkey, telling you, 
you convincing yourself that you will never be good. You're not good for nothing. Oh, I don't deserve that. I don't deserve specific type of people deserve living in a good house, driving a good car. You know, specific people deserve going to this lovely, lovely holiday. So I think what changed for me was I started to transition my mindset that I am ordinary, but I could become extraordinary. And I started to kind of follow success. And I started to kind of follow wealth creation. And these okay. were, I think these were things that kept me going, you know, to that point where I actually completely rediscovered myself in 2018. 2018 was my year of complete rediscovery, having started in property. So, so let, let's talk a bit about the property then. So, um, so because where, whereabouts in, in London do you actually invest, Daniel? Where, whereabouts is it? Funny enough, I'm based in South London in Bromley and I invest in South London. Oh, South London. Okay. <laughs> I don't know London too well, so you have to bear with us on this. Um, <laughs> so I understand uh, from the research that I've done, it was rent to rent, rent to HMO. So are those strategies that work in your area? And is that something that you still do? Yes, um, I started with rent to rent and very quickly I went into um, deal sourcing. Now, it was quite funny how it all started, right? So when I decided to get myself educated and you know how it is, property education is not cheap, right? It's not cheap. And sometimes most people say it's a scam, it's not going to work. Why would you spend money for people to teach you? how to do properties and but I took that leap of faith right and I got started through coaching mentorship training seminars networking you name it so I learned got the skills that required me to do it so I remember uh, I first learned about rent to rent then I got my first rent to rent deal what became a challenge was I didn't have the seven thousand pounds that I needed to pay the rent First month's rent, I didn't have the £7,000 inclusive, all right? I needed to pay my deposit, uh, furnish the property. So I didn't have that. So I remember going back to my mentor at that time and I said, I've got this, I've got this property, you know, um, I can't, I don't have £7,000. I only had about, about, I think I had about just about £1,000 uh, in my bank or rather on my credit card at that time. So he said, why don't you sell it? And I said, how can I sell it? And he said, well, you have a Facebook page. You have a lot of people that you're talking to that now knows you're doing property. Why don't you just say on Facebook, you got this property, just kind of talk through it. So I remember talking through it and a couple of weeks, I think it was the next day, someone reached out to me, oh, I'm investing locally in the area. I've got six, seven properties in my portfolio. Uh, I like to view that property. So. I ended up selling that property deal and I, that property deal gave me just under £2,000. And I was like, no way, this is not real. Someone just paid me to introduce them to a letting's agent and take over a deal from me. I'm like, I'm going to do this multiple times. And that got me my first deal, got me my second deal. And I sold those two deals, generated me about £4,000. And I went on to take a paid loan and I had a difference now, which was, I think I made £4,000 from two deals. 3,000 pounds from payday loan. And I found a third deal. When I found the third deal, I was like, no way I'm going to sell this now. I want to keep this because I want to generate cash flow month in, month out. So I um, eventually took on that very first deal and that property was generating me 600 pounds. I still have that property to today, generating me over 600 pounds now. Um, so, and that was how my journey literally started using rent to rent. You know, for rent to rent, people think, you know, it's, it's, it's illegal. Now, if you do it correctly, controlling other people's properties, just like Uber, right? For those who are listening, you know, Uber don't own a car, a single car, but they own the biggest taxi network in the entire globe. Airbnbs, right, owns no accommodation on hotels or properties, but it is one of the biggest hotel network in the group, in the whole world, sorry, generating massive, massive amount of money in the whole world. So this same thing with rent to rent. So rent to rent was a very soft landing for me to control someone else's property, generate 600 pounds cash flow month in month out, 
and also be able to sell multiple of those information to someone else to pay me more money. So at that time, I felt like, I was like, whoa, 12 months from now, I'm getting out of my Uber driver job. And I remember October 2020, I became a full-time property investor and financially free. Um, I had great income coming in from my property business. And I was like, Uber, see you later. Thank you very much. It was nice knowing you. <laughs> and I just went all in. So within the very first year, I managed to do just around 20 property deals. Okay. So is, that, is that just to jump in? So is that 20 deals that you sourced for somebody else? Or is that 20 rent to rents that you've done for 20 yourself? 20 rent to rent deals, which yeah. within eight, I kept eight for myself. Okay. And I sold 12 deals. So which generated me a significant amount of money. Had a great turnover just around. We, we had done over £80,000 in, in gross revenue. Uh, just within that first year, because I was dabbing in and out of being an Uber driver, being a property investor. But then again, that was a great place for me to start. So I said to myself, now that I've got great income coming in by October 20, uh, 2020, so 20, 2018, I said to myself, uh, I'm going to do this full time now. So I quit my Uber driving job. And the following year, I increased, I literally increased my portfolio to 15 properties. I was controlling and uh, this was just hmos and um, um second year again sold multiple property deals as well using the deal sourcing strategy so i was using both of them at the same time so they were rent to rent property yeah. deals that i could take on all right but at some point i needed the cash flow so i needed to to in, keep injecting cash into my my portfolio so i will sell a deal maybe for 1500 for 2000 for 3000 wherever it is just to keep an income coming I wasn't one of those sources who would say, if it's, if it's not 3,000 plus, I'm not going to sell. So I was like, I'll sell it for 1,500. If I get 15, I'll sell it for 18. If I get it, I'll sell it for, two, you know, for 2,000. If I get it, I'll sell it for 3,000. So that was just me. So I just kept selling, yeah. selling and creating. The second year, we done, we literally doubled our gross revenue. We've done over 200,000 pounds, you know, in, you know, in our business. And at that time, I, just, I decided, I said, you know what? I am going to start buying properties now. So I started leveraging on that, you know, I started leveraging on that people, you know, I started putting myself out there. I started building my network. I started shouting about what I was doing and I just kept attracting more people, investors. I was just basically attracting anyone to myself. People started asking me, how did you do it? You know, we thought I needed 50,000 pounds to get into property, but you're doing it. You're doing it full time. What's the secret? So in uh, 2019, we decided to launch, I decided to launch a networking event, uh, which was then at that time, was it was named the Rent to Rent Property Network. So we launched that in September, 2019. And I remember our very first networking event, we had about 80, so between 70 to 80 people in attendance. And I just kept giving information, giving value. And a lot of people started on the back of that. I offered free mentorship just to share what I was doing. I did, to be honest, at that time, I didn't even realize I was mentoring people until I met my other new mentor. Uh, I think it was in, it was in around, around October, you know, I met my mentor on a one-to-one, -one, my business mentor, because I had several mentors, I had several coaches um, who was showing me, for example, how to use social media how to even talk, how to converse. I had different types of people working with me. So, and he said, well, you've been doing this for two years, you know, and you're doing networking event is great. You know, you might want to, in the nearest future, think about maybe coaching and mentoring people. So I said, well, I'll think about that. But we kept networking, we kept doing that. So around about September, September November 20, uh, 2019, I acquired my first property in Bromley. Um, the, the, this, 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 this is quite funny how I actually acquired this property, right? So we used to live in this house for 13 years. Myself and my wife, we bought the house in 2006 when we got married. So having done rent to rent and increased my portfolio, I said to my wife, we're going to convert this house because it's a great location. I did all the due diligence needed and the outstanding mortgage on that property was just about 200 and 20, 220, 225,000 pounds. So I had to use creative finance, raise the money, paid off the entire debt left on the property. 
And we moved out into a different property, which I bought using a delay completion strategy to acquire. So we moved into the house, all right? And we bought our previous property outright. So I can convert it from a standard C3 property into a C4 property, which was a luxury finished property. And I did that in 2019. And just during the early part of lockdown, we managed to complete that property. And after we finished that property, um, the property got revalued at seven hundred thousand pounds. All right, and uh, what did you pay for it? Sorry, I paid the entire the 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 the, the mortgage. Our standing mortgage on the property was two hundred and twenty five thousand pounds. All right, and I raised used creative finance to that, yeah. pay off the debt like seven hundred bloody hell. And then I spent about one hundred and fifty three thousand pounds. And I always think people I borrowed money from here and there. The total cost anyway came up to about just under 490,000 pounds when I finished the entire project. Yeah. Now, just June 2020, that property, when the market was opened back, that property got revalued for 700,000 pounds. I was able to walk away with about 300,000 pounds from one property deal. And that was a game changer for me. Having 300,000 pounds, I just went crazy, gone lazy. And, uh, and I remember within the last 18 months, I've acquired seven properties, um, completed two projects. I currently got about um, four property projects with a GDV of about 5 million when it's completed come about April next year. So the game just changed. And also during the lockdown, we launched a, people, people kept coming to me and asking me, so I created a property wealth education. And, you know, just to help a little bit more, you know, help more people that was coming to my networking event because so many people was not coming to me because I had the networking event ongoing. And during the lockdown, we had that networking event completely for free and we kept giving people information. And, you know, Property Wealth Education now has helped hundreds of individuals just in the last 18 months get started in property as well. So for me, it's, it's been a phenomenal journey. Like, from 2016 to 2017, 18, 19, I've just seen myself grow from nothing, basically from nothing. And I think one of my greatest motivation has been the fact that people who didn't know this existed, they now know that this, anyone can start something, no matter what your challenges are, no matter what you've been through in life. There's something I always love to say, no matter how many times life knocks you down, as long as you keep falling, but don't fall sideways, fall on your back. Very important, fall on your back so that you can look up. Because if you can look up, right, you can get up. You can pick up yourself and start all over again. You know, this is not going to take you one year or two years to be very successful. So in the last four or five years, I've now created a business from nothing with, you know, with a current valuation in excess of over 2.2 million, all right? My rent to rent business doing over, you know, you know, you know, seven figures, so six figures, sorry, doing over six figures. And anyone can do this, but all you need is to, you know, to be consistent, keep showing up, all right? Have the hunger to be successful. Mm. Can, I, can I jump in a couple of things there? Because I, I just want to pull back a couple of points. Um, so... If you, if you, first of all, in London, it's very, very different than the northeast where I live. Like talking about properties worth seven hundred thousand, there's there's not that many. <laughs> you know, the average property value about yeah, probably about one hundred and fifty. That capital growth is crazy. Um, but it is it it's 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 all relative, isn't it? You know, the deposits and the investment, and the refurbs higher down there as well as as up here. But um, so first of all, what so the strategies you currently have in your portfolio are these buy to let? Are these HMOs? Are these SA? Or do you do a bit of everything? Well, um, good question, actually. So I still deal source till today. Still deal source, okay. Uh, rent to rent, I stopped. Oh, you've stopped, okay. I, I stopped thought it was just about to ask it. Is it now yeah. fully went to, to own yeah. it? So I capped my portfolio at 15 properties. So I've got 15 rent to rent and I've stopped that. I stopped that November. I stopped that in November last year. I said to myself, no way, I'm not doing rent to rent anymore. Just I've got got enough cash flow coming through of that, mm -hmm. but I've now gone into buying my own properties. So, like I said, I've now completed 
three refurbs, which is using the buy, refurb, ref, buy rent, refurbish, refinance. Yeah. I've completed three projects. So, yeah, uh, the okay. first project was the very one I started in 2019, got completed just before lock, just around lockdown uh, last year. Then I, I, got a, I bought a second one during lockdown uh, for 450 and it got revalued. Uh, I completed that project, I bought it for 450, right? And that property got revalued for 950,000 now. Crazy money, isn't it? Crazy money. It's just yeah, good. and I have one single let. I have one single let on my portfolio, which was the first property that I bought using delayed completion. And I currently now don't own where I live. I'm currently renting where I live. Mm. All right. So I have moved that from my property that I used delayed completion to buy. And now I'm moving to a rented property. And because there is no point owning at the moment, it's all about creating wealth. So yeah. my portfolio pays me an income, my income pays for my rent, I'm good. And I just continue to use, increase, you know, more, you know, get more debt to create more uh, capital appreciation. And, and, and what would you say, if you park rent to rent, um, what would you say in your area? is the best strategy would you, or the, the the best strategy right now is it SA is it is it HMOs is it straight back to let I don't know the yield isn't as high as up north um down there on your buy to let but what what would you what would you say is the, if you had to pick one out of the three buy to let HMO SA what would you say is the best strategy in, in South London? Well two perspectives to those questions if you're someone who's looking to get started then that question that answer to that question is is completely different right if you're already someone who's investing in property, then again, the, the answer to the question is also very different. So I'm going to break it down in three, in three ways, right? So if you're somebody who's looking to get started in my area, so SA and HMOs would be a great way to start, especially when it comes to using rent to rent to drive that. So if you can rent to rent a property that you can use for service accommodation, you know, Service accommodation, you're looking about making 600 pounds to 2,000 pounds profit a month, but obviously that would be your, your gross profit, not your net profit. Mm -hmm. So, because you might have other expenses to pay, like maybe for mo your mobile phone bills for your company, your laptop, your rent, if you have an office, if that's the case. Or, um, you know, if you're someone who's looking to also, you know, not focus on seasons, because the essay strategy is focus on. You know what's what's the season is it summer is it winter is it spring obviously there are different you know times where there it's there's peak and off peaks right so it's all subject to that individuals but again you're running like a hotel unlike the hmos there will always be demand for rooms because the council wants to work with you you know um you know home, homeless people wants to you know homeless people society or charities want to work with you so they can get people on the streets, pay for their rent. You know, professionals wants to work with you. Contractors want to work with you. The market is vast. So you could control someone's property using rent to rent and offer ourselves accommodation, offer HMOs and renting rooms to people. Now, for me now, I'm not doing, I'm not using rent to rent to take control of people's property. So what I'm not doing since the beginning of this year, strictly is acquiring properties all right, and then you know, forcing the value of that property within a short space of six to nine months and pulling all my money back out, all right, and just keep doing the same over and over and over and over again. You know, just using that momentum to acquire more property because once you use the buy refurbishment finance strategy, what's happening here is you're getting paid five times, all right, and you have total control. Unlike rent to rent, you know. Rent to rent, for me, I think rent to rent is just a beginner's journey. Mm. I'll be very frank and honest. Build your capital up, isn't it? Yeah, it is just a beginner's journey. All right. So get in with rent to rent, low barrier to entry, get up and running, get started, understand the industry, and very, very quickly, you want to actually transition to acquiring assets. Don't go blow the money. Don't go on holidays and start, you know, buying Rolexes when you're doing rent to rent. You know. Buy Rolexes when you, <laughs> you do finish doing the first buy for rich or separate as a reward to yourself. Now, the thing about rent to rent is most people get into rent to rent and thinking that, you know, it's just going to make them rich overnight, but that's not the case. You've got to grow first as a business, reinvest that capital in the business. 
do the work. There is it's not rent to rent and self accommodation when you get started. It's not passive. It's not all right. Except you just want to throw in the money and someone does the work for you. So build it very quickly so that in the nearest future, maybe a year or two years time, or like myself, you can start acquiring your own asset, leveraging on the rent to rent business that you've already created. I think that would be the best way to answer the question. Definitely. So yeah, yeah, that's, that's fair. And, and you are right. You know that it depends on what stage you're at. It depends on how much capital you've got. It depends on your long-term goals, your age and, and your experience and various other things to depend on that strategy. Uh, or de- which determines which strategy is best. Um, I was more curious just because I know what works up in the Northeast and I haven't got a clue what works down <laughs> works down there. Uh, it's a different world. But um, thank you for that. Um, so um, a couple of less sort of specific questions I, th- I suppose I'd, I'd like to ask you just before we wrap up. Um, you've talked about, it sounds like you're doing multiple strategies, which I like. I'm a big believer in not just doing one strategy. Maybe he's at the start doing one just to get your head around it. But once you're a few years in, I do think it's really important to do or to have different strategies. But I think deal sourcing, by deal sourcing in volume, which you've been doing, you'll you'll learn all strategies because I imagine it's not just deal source from end to end. It's, it's deal source and other things. So I, I agree with what you're saying anyway. Um, Absolutely. So... Um, have you ever used any angel investment, uh, Daniel, or has it all been from your own money in terms of the deal source of money that you've generated, the rent to rent income? Has that funded everything? Or have you ever worked with JV partners, angel investors, anything? Good question, actually. Um, before I actually give an answer, there's a massive disclaimer here. So whatever I'm going to say right now, it's, it's it was what Daniel used. All right. So I'm not advising in any way anyone should do it. Yeah. So in terms of raising finance, I've gone, if you heard me say, for example, I started with payday loans, okay? So I use payday loans, I use credit cards because my credit was terrible, all right? So just over the last 18 months alone, I've borrowed money from friends. I've uh, had build a joint venture with me. So get into the project, do the project, this is the amount of money I'm going to give to you, i.e. 20%, 40%. When I refinance, I'm going to pay you, you know, what I owe you with a little bit of an interest. You know, I've used every, like, I've used any single type of funding that you can think of. So from joint venture, uh, not actually giving, you know, capital, uh, capital appreciation, but just giving a return on investment, yes. Uh, loan, a simple loan, uh, loan agreement into one of my SPVs. Yes, I have uh, offering, you know, great return on investment to that particular family member or somebody that knew me uh, within my network. Yes. And also um, leveraging on business, you know, uh, expansion loan. All right. I have as well, as well as, you know, taking overdrafts, you know, just to make sure the project goes through and I've used any type of loan you know, and uh, just over the last uh, 18 months, we've I've raised over half a million pounds, you know, to do multiple projects, um, you know, and I'm just about to raise a million using a craft funding platform, which is about to be uh, launched in two, three months from now as well, because we're looking to raise a million pounds uh, for the first time, we're really raising that in a goal. I mean, one of my biggest goal is to actually be able to raise at least, um, you know, a minimum of 100 million pounds, you know, within the next, you know, 15, 15 years and so on and so forth. And because I have a massive ambition to creating a big, big portfolio, going to land development, commercial conversions, you know, um, developing multiple flats. And that is the vision, you know, right. and also not just here in the UK to take this back, maybe to, you know, a lot of other African nations, you know. That that's that was gonna be one of my questions, but you've just you've just said it. I was gonna I was gonna say, would you ever consider investing back, back in Nigeria? But you've just, just answered that. Just just one thing I'm picking up from you, um, just thinking about the conversation is you seem to be diverse in your strategies, but you're also diverse in how you in how you fund them. And I think people can take something from that because you know, although I've just kind of said that sometimes at the start, it's important to start 
focus on one strategy. Yeah. People might be focusing on one strategy in terms of where they get the money from. So that might be they might be relying on the salary to fund the first deposit. Yeah. That's probably going to take you quite a while to build a large portfolio if you're solely relying on one source of income. Likewise, if you're just relying on buy to let, especially in Newcastle, maybe it's not London, mm-hmm. you'll make 250 or 300 quid net profit per month. You need quite a few of those to become really, really wealthy. Absolutely. So I think what I'm picking up is it's important to be diverse in your strategies in terms of the type of properties you buy and how you buy them. But it's also important to be diverse in how you fund them and how you use angel investment, J- JVs, payday loans and things. Again, I'm not endorsing payday loans because you won't get a mortgage if you get a payday loan pretty much for quite a while after a payday loan. But definitely there's good debt and bad debt and there's definitely a difference. Credit cards, all my drafts I use as well. Um, that's just what I'm picking up from you. And I think that's a really good lesson for anybody listening that don't put all your eggs in one basket, have multiple eggs in multiple baskets. And that's on your strategy and how you buy and what you buy, but that's also on how you fund it, I think. Yeah, and, and just to quickly add to that as well, at the beginning of my, you know, 2017 when I started, like I said, my credit was terrible. You know, payday loan was the way out. Obviously, I don't use payday loans now, you know, but 2017 I was. You know, but now that I'm now that I'm using other creative finance, I don't go, I don't touch it. I don't even need it anymore. Yeah, well, exactly. You know, uh, but and then again, when it also comes to raising finance, what you also want to do is to get good first. You know, I always say this: get good in knowing and understanding how to use one strategy to do property. The same way you need to get good in one way of raising money. So first thing I really got good at was to fix credit scores. My credit score got fixed then I was able to get the business expansion loans. I was able to get good overdraft facilities from my bank. I was also get to go, you know, learn how to build, I, 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 learned, I learned how to build, you know, I learned how to build, um, you, know, you know, my credit, you know, up and so on and so yeah, forth. Yeah. And that's what you really want to learn. Get master at it and then eventually, uh, you know, do, you know, you, you know, master different types of ways of raising money. Yeah, definitely. What well, one thing at a time, isn't it? I think it's a really important point as well. See, I'm I own a mortgage brokers and and the um, it's quite scary how many people come to us with a really bad or poor credit score. And a lot of young people still don't understand, you know, the importance of it, but how to fix it as well. And I think that's a good point. You know, if you don't know, there's loads of stuff online. Speak to someone like Daniel or myself, speak to an expert on it, speak to a mortgage broker. But there's loads of simple ways to improve your credit, but you need to protect that credit rating. Your credit is your lifeline. It's your everything. credit is your lifeline. Like I did a video about it the other day, right? I said, if you don't have credit score, if you don't know how to take care of your credit score, you are literally dead and you cannot do property. And, and it goes even beyond credit score, right? It goes even beyond managing your credit score. When you start using a lot of finances to fund a project, they also look at your financial responsibility. Are you somebody who is always shopping on Amazon? Are you somebody who's always just dining out? Lenders, underwriters look at that. So it's not just that you've got a great credit score, but again, you're not managing your finance the right way. You're always spending money. So we can't trust you. I have had underwriters, you know, in the past, you know, raise some questions that in my life I would never believe it. You know, and especially, especially at the minute, a lending's really accessible with low rates, but the banks are horrific. Yeah, the question that they're asking is just beyond belief, isn't it? Absolutely. Um, but not honestly, you're, you're spot on. I think that's another key learning for anybody listening is protect that credit score like it's everything. Because even if you make a million pounds a year, but you've got a bad credit rating, you ain't getting a mortgage. It's quite it's simple as that, regardless of how much you earn. If that credit's rating, if you have missed or late payments recently, bankruptcy, CCJs, all these things, you, you know, you, you, you're going to struggle. Um, but just to wrap up then, Daniel, if someone wants to reach out, if someone wants to find you, follow your journey, look at what you do, what is the best way and where do people find you? I have the, the, I've got, I'm literally everywhere on social media, but I think the one where I personally understand is Instagram. So um, I personally there, I do, even though I have, you know, people, you know, working with me who helps me out, manage all my platforms. So Instagram is one of the best. So if you want to reach out to me on Instagram as Daniel Moses DM, 
you know, on Instagram, you find me there. I'm on Twitter, I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Facebook, I'm on TikTok, everywhere, it's the same name, Daniel versus DM. And also uh, my personal website is, you know, www.danielmosesdm.com. So yeah, especially for those of you in London, if you want to reach out, make sure, uh, you know, you go, you, you, you know, you reach out to me on all this stuff. And then also I've got a book called The Rent to Rent Made Easy. Basically, I poured out all my heart in my experience setting up a rent to rent business. Uh, it was launched just in June the 8th, uh, we made an Amazon bestseller. So uh, for those of you who, you know, just want to get basic information, make sure you go on Amazon and look up that book or just type in Daniel Moses and it will automatically come up anyways. Perfect. Daniel, thank you so, so much. I've enjoyed the episode. Thank you for sharing your journey. And um, thanks for your time. Thank you so much, Terry, for having me. I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, looking forward to, to see you soon again. Hopefully catch up soon. Yeah, that'd be really nice, mate. Thanks Absolutely. a lot, Daniel. Take care. Bye-bye.